you well. Thank you, Colin. Very tough to follow a politician. Uh, good to be with. I used to make politicians upset in my previous job in South Africa. Uh, we had, an, yeah, we had a, uh, the so-called Chapter Nine and Ten bodies, uh, which which tried to keep account. Uh, very briefly, I will uh, focus on what the UN and the UNDP has done uh, in, in, in terms of national evaluation capacity. Um, and the way it's been articulated within the UNDP, we came up with what is called the National Evaluation Capacity Workshop Seminar Series, which began in Morocco, went to South Africa, and last year was in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and next year is going to be in Asia, which in essence is a manner in which we brought together governments from various countries to discuss the key issues of transparency, uh, accountability, um, independence, credibility. So through an in engagement with the governments, uh, a way in which to uh, advance them in, in improving their policies and the capacity domain. Uh, last year was a, uh, a milestone in the sense that we brought in for the first time the VOPIs, uh, eval partners came in, and we had the associations, a really big event, and got government to start seeing what the capacities are with the associations as well as, as, well as civil society, as well as the UN and the UN officers, because it cannot be done alone, as has already been point, uh, pointed out. Uh, the Brazil event was a first, because we, we went even uh, broader. Uh, but more significantly, it's to try and bring in greater voice. Uh, so apart from having 61 countries, which in essence is 61 governments there, many from the newly independent states, etc. Uh, it's a way in which to galvanize and to sustain a support in how do you improve the, the capacity. And that had a very interactive methodology where we had deep discussion rather than the presentation of papers to have people focus on the challenges and solutions in, in, in building national evaluation capacity. Uh, you can go on to the, the, the link and the website. Uh, all the video presentations, discussions, debates, etc., are all contained therein. Uh, moving forward, key questions. We need to now be a little more critical and ask the question whether these networks, etc., are they really uh, advancing or do they become ends in themselves? And I think it's quite fundamental because to just use an indicator of the increased number of associations and networks does not point to the deeper substantive uh, nature of whether there really is capacity and quality being developed at that level. So I would uh, disagree that it's just the numbers, uh, the increase, the geographic spread, which is adequate in terms of building up capacity. We know for a fact that many of the networks, many of the associations that I've been involved in, uh, in one substantively in South Africa, but more important uh, for a long period in Africa, they're just not sustainable. They're one-person operations. And so therefore, to use an indicator, well, we have an association, we have a president, and these people go off and have a few events. Really, when you speak to governments, and we engage very closely, they really don't know about it, they do not see the value addition. Um, the second issue, what do commitments mean in practice? In the Sao Paulo event, we had 18 commitments, which I'll uh, briefly show and you can look in detail. But to take a commitment and to translate it into something that's actionable, that eventually brings about a change on the ground, is very, very difficult. And even as evaluators, we need to be more self-critical than constantly talking about our expansion. Expansion? It may be geographic, it may be vertical, it may be horizontal, but is it bringing about a change on the ground? Is it really uh, helping in, in, in that regard is a fundamental question. And the third question I pose, how can UNAIC partner in a creative way to build on the national evaluation capacity and, and advance the SO of UNAIC? The SO are the strategic objective areas. The UNAIC uh, has now four areas, and each of these areas is meant to align and to regenerate UNEG in a way in which it brings about change. The area that I'm involved in is evaluation, uh, the evaluation function, norms and standards, peer reviews, there's other areas on partnership, etc. And if you look at that, it's, it's supposed to bring about this change. Uh, you can go into the link, we don't have time, and you'll see exactly what the commitments are. All this is in the public domain, we've got a new website. Uh, you wouldn't be able to read it from where you are, but in a nutshell, these are the commitments that were made by a combination of UN, UNDP, government, civil society, associations. People signed on it. And this is the things they said they're going to do. Now the challenge is how do you monitor this in a context of national ownership globally? And that's an issue that I'm looking at very closely as we move to the next event in Asia. So for example, if I just look at uh, commitment uh, eight, 
develop approaches based on lessons learned on how to incorporate cultural dimensions into evaluation in different regional and national contexts. Each of these is a huge question. And the only way it can, can happen is if we, in this regard, have partnerships that support it in a creative way. So if you go to the next co uh, uh, commitment uh, 13, translate material on evaluation into different languages. It still remains largely English, French. Uh, we are trying at, the, at, at, the, at my office level to, to translate the assessment of development results into local language. It's difficult, but also to make it more accessible using video and using audio links. Because there's a great disconnect between the expertise and elitism of evaluators and what goes on in the ground. In most cases, we don't even go back and feed results. So these are the aspects that have come through in this regard. And of course, commitment 18, uh, incorporate gender capacity perspectives in monitoring and evaluation national systems. My colleague Marco would be very happy to see we have that element. Uh, because the evaluations are largely gender blind, but even the evaluators that have been uh, conducting them tend to be Anglo-Saxon male. And that has been the trend, both at the evaluator level and at the consultant level. So where are the indicators now to bring about that change and also to, to really build evaluation capacity uh, using local knowledge? We, need, we have to move away from the notion that evaluation ca uh, capacity and expertise is something that is dominated in a certain part of the world. There's a, uh, and the only place you can learn is from that part of the world. Most of my experience in Africa has clearly shown that some of the deep methodologies that emerge from governments doing evaluators in, in, uh, at that level have been extremely powerful. The problem, of course, uh, in the South, there isn't much of a culture of writing and documenting. So because they are not in the mainstream literature, there's an assumption that nothing is happening. And how do you use um, evaluation to move, for example, the theme in 2004 uh, in, in Johannesburg to use evaluation to move from Afro-pessimism to Afro-optimism and to use evaluation to actually uh, be an instrument also not only to bring about transparency but also to uh, enhance and improve democracy. I know right now as we talk in South Africa an evaluation by the public protector has helped to bring about democracy. And of course uh, the summary is there and you can look at the link. And I'll stop at this point because I think there's adequate information.